Good morning everybody, it's 9 o'clock and 9 o'clock is with me, Father Warner. We are in Tuesday of the 33rd week in Ordinary Time. Yesterday we began studying the book of Revelation. It was a long teaching of almost 29 minutes and I hope you listen to that before you listen to this teaching because I am taking the trouble to explain to you the book of Revelation, simplifying it so that it doesn't become that book that when we come to the last book of the Bible, we close it and say, hey, I can't handle all that I read there because I don't understand it. Here's your chance to study Revelation with me. Now, the liturgy of today uh, takes chapter 3 verses 1 to 6 and verses 14 to 22. But if you look at your Bible, yesterday we ended in chapter 2 verse uh, 5. So all the way down, several uh, passages have been dropped by the liturgy. So go back and read the various messages to the church in Smyrna, uh, Pergamum, Thyatira, uh, and also the church in Philadelphia. Um, please do that. Anyway, I'm going to read the text. I've entitled today's uh, teaching, Some Faked It, Some Did Not Make It. Yeah, you'll see uh, what I mean because some of the churches faked it. Yeah, they faked their behavior and some simply did not cut the, uh, cut the mark. So let's read the text first and then I will explain it to you. First, I'll read chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, which is the message to the church to Sardis. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a name of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is on the point of death, for I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. Remember then what you have received and heard, obey it and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. Yet you have still a few persons in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. If you conquer, you will be clothed like them in white robes, and I will not blot your names out of the book of life. I will confess your name before my Father and before his angels. Let anyone who has ears, let anyone who has an ear, listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Then, verses 14 to 22, a message to the church in Laod Laodicea. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the origin of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I needed nothing. You do not realize that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Therefore, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fires, so that you may be rich, and white robes to clothe yourselves, and to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen, and... and and to anoint your eyes so that you may see. I reprove and discipline those who I love. Be earnest, therefore, and repent. Listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come to you and eat with you and you with me. To the one who conquers, I will give a place with me on my throne, just as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. The word of the Lord. Now, the author of the book of Revelation, as I said yesterday, is attributed as John the Apostle. And he is writing his revelation of what he saw and what he heard. We saw this in chapter verse, uh, in chapter 1, verse 10. He is writing what he heard and what he saw in his penal Roman 
colony on the island of Patmos. Patmos was off the coast of uh, modern day Turkey. And he's writing this revelation at the command, as we are told, the command of the Son of Man in chapter 1 verse 12, who we are told also is the Alpha and the Omega. Look at chapter 1 verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, who, as we read yesterday in chapter 2, was holding in his right hand the seven stars, which were the seven angels of the seven churches in Ephesus. John now addresses the seven churches in chapter 2 and 3, uh, mentioned in Revelations chapter 1 verse 11. He addresses each of these churches one by one. And this you will see him doing, as I said, in chapters 2 and 3. Yesterday we studied the introduction to the book of Revelation and the message to the first and the most important of these seven churches, that is Ephesus. Now, our lectionary text will skip the messages to the churches uh, in Smyrna, in Pergamum, in Thyatira, which is mentioned in chapter 2. And it will also skip uh, the message to the church in Philadelphia in chapter 3. However, in today's text, we will look at the church of Sardis and the church of Laodicea. Now, it is important to say that when you study the text, and message to all the seven churches, no two churches face the same situation either in their persecution or in their response to the persecution. And this is a great approach to dealing with an archdiocese, a parish or a community. You know, we need to stop painting everyone with the same brush or thinking all parishes in Bombay are the same. You know, every church or every community is unique. Its challenges, its situations are unique just as the same can be said of every human being. Every human being is unique. However, when you look at these seven churches, there are commonalities in the way the churches are also addressed. You know, each church is addressed by God through the author. This address reveals a very intimate knowledge that God shares about each of these churches. God expresses his first-hand knowledge of each of these churches if you look and I've circled them in my Bible with the words, I know. To each of the churches, he says, I know. He mentions them seven times, once to each of the churches. If you look at your Bible, you'll see it in chapter 2, verse 2, in chapter 2, verse 9, in chapter 2, verse 13, in chapter 2, verse 19, in chapter 3, verse um, 1, in chapter 3, verse 8, in chapter 3, verse 15. Uh, constantly God will say, I know. He knows his churches intimately. And it is this intimate knowledge of every church of his that permits him to lay out their issues, to console them, to take them to task, warn them of their sufferings, assure them of his promises. So I recommend you read chapter 2 and 3 for yourself to see this intimate knowledge that God has of every church. And if God has this intimate knowledge of every church, he has this intimate knowledge of every one of us. He knows us, God knows us, and therefore what he tells us is based on his knowledge of us. Now, while we see an intimate knowledge of God of his churches, we also see and we read of a plea from God to heed his message. You know, seven times in chapters 2 and 3 you will read the words, let anyone who has an ear it should be, let anyone who has ears, but it says, let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Read it again. You'll see this in chapter 2, verse 7, chapter 2, verse 11, chapter 2, verse 17, chapter 2, verse 29. You'll see it in chapter 3, uh, verse 6, and then chapter 2, um, again. So read it every time in, in chapter 3, I think, verse let me look at that again, uh, chapter 3, verse 13. So constantly, yeah, he's saying this again and again to his church. Now, there is a, a point of, for reflection in all of this. You see, when God says, let anyone who has anger, there's a point of reflection. It is not that we don't have ears. We do. It's just that we don't want to listen. The Spirit 
is speaking clearly to his church or in these cases the spirit is speaking clearly to his churches. This is not some past tense mention of for a bygone era. It is the present tense. I'm in, uh, I'm uh, uh, punning and I'm doing that intentionally. It is the present tense. It's a present tense application even to the church today. The church is speaking to us. The spirit is speaking to us even today in the present tense because our present is tense and God is speaking to us. So while each church is addressed separately and each church is understood or judged or warned accordingly, each church, if you look in these two chapters, is also offered a promise. Seven individual promises are made to the seven churches in Asia. In chapter 2 verse 7, you'll see the tree of life, which was once given to Adam and Eve in paradise, is, prof is promised to the Ephesians. In chapter 2, verse 10, you will see that Smyrna is promised the crown of life if they are faithful unto death. In chapter 2, verse 7, Pergamum, the third city, is promised a white stone with a new name if they conquer their sins. In chapter 2, verse 26 and verse 27, Thyatira, what are they promised? Thyatira is promised authority. I will give authority over the nations, verse 26, to rule with them with an iron rod as when clay pots are shattered. So they are given, uh, promised a rule with an iron rod if they too conquer their sins. Then to the church in Sardis, Sardis is given the promise of being clothed in white and a further promise of not being blotted out of the book of life and another promise of being testified before the Father and before angels. Yeah, Look at it chapter 3, look at it in verse 5. And then to Philadelphia is given the promise of being made into a permanent pillar in the temple of God with a promise to be branded with God's name. Finally, to the church in Laodicea is given the promise to be seated with God on the throne, just as Jesus himself conquered and sat down with his father on the throne. Each of the seven churches are known intimately with God. Each of the seven churches are told by God, listen to me, listen, give me a year, change your ways. And each of the seven churches are told, if you listen and keep my, my, my word, I promise you something. Each of the church, seven churches were given a promise by God. Now, our text of today focuses on two of the cities, as I said. Um, in chapter 3, uh, the city of Sardis and the city of Laodicea. Now, Sardis was situated about 30 miles southeast of Thyatira, one of the other seven uh, cities. Sardis was formerly the capital of an ancient kingdom of Lydia and uh, it reached the peak of its prosperity during the reign of the fabulous uh, Croesus, somewhere in the year 560 BC. Then under the Persian rule, um, Sardis fell into decline but it recovered some of its earlier importance once again under Roman rule. In the year 17 AD, Sardis was devastated by an earthquake and it was rebuilt through the generosity of the Roman Emperor Tiberius. Uh, Sardis competed for the honour of erecting a temple therefore to the Roman Emperor but it lost out to another of the seven cities, Smyrna. Um, early Greek historians also accused the city of Sardis of luxury and of immorality. Now Sardis, the city, was perceived by other cities as being a city full of life. But when you read the text of today, the Lamb of God declares it to be a city that was dead in reality. You see, what God is saying is, look you guys in Sardis, what you're putting up is a good show for others. And sometimes the same can be said of our many churches filled with activities. Is it happening church? Yes, it's full of show. Yeah, but God asked the church in Sardis, 
says, I don't want to see your activities. I want to see you revive your dying spiritual life before it's too late. This they are to do, the city is to do by doing, how are they going to get it? He says, recall what was taught to you and not what you all have come to believe. You see, if the city of Sardis, if they failed to clutch on to this last lease of life that God was giving them, they would be overcome by the sudden arrival of Jesus. As he says, I will come like a thief in the night and you will not know what hour I have come. But while Sardis as a city had drifted, we are also told in verse 4 that a few persons were not influenced by this Roman paganism. And therefore God says they are worthy of his promises of walking around in those white clothes. Now, uh, as I said, if Sardis had faked it, only pretended to be alive, and that's why I said the city of Sardis had faked it, the city of Laodicea did not make it. Yeah, because straight away we are told they are lukewarm. Read uh, verse 16. Laodicea, the city, stands accused for not taking a stand and judgment was about to be passed on them. So God would rather have them, as he said, God says, I'd rather have you cold. I would like you to be hot with your, with your, with your faith, but I'd rather have you cold uh, than to have you the way uh, he knew them, which was rather, they stood rather lukewarm. They had become a lukewarm people. And this lukewarm faith was the result, as we are told very clearly, this lukewarm faith is the result of the wealth their city had come to acquire. You know, uh, Laodicea was situated along the Lycus River. Even if you look at the map right now, um, which I posted yesterday on potipadre.com, you'll see two rivers. And uh, Laodicea was a tributary of one of the major rivers uh, of the Lycus River. And uh, this was an important commercial city. It was important for its banking. It was important also for its medical care. So Laodicea as a city had achieved much of its wealth due to its manufacture of woolen goods and also for a very popular eye medicine which was known as the Phrygian powder that was used in the Laodicean school of medicine. So therefore this community had been founded, uh, which we know this, uh, the faith of this community had been founded as early as Paul's days, but had now grown to be very affluent and this money had gone to their head, literally. Now, in this wealth, therefore, the Laodiceans thought that they found security and they felt that they needed nothing from God. Look at verse 17, uh, chapter 3. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, God included. You know, yet to these and to all wealthy people who become del delusional with their false security of wealth, God has not one but several words. Look what God says to them. He says, you are wretched, you are pitiable, you are poor, you are blind and you are naked. In verse 17. Don't let your money go to your head. Yeah? Don't let your money think that you can miss Sunday Mass. Don't let your money think that you are better than everybody else in church. So if they are to store for themselves anything worthwhile, says uh, the message of God, it should have been not the gold that is in their bank, but the gold that meets God's standards of refining. Yeah? Therefore, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, not the, not the fake gold that you have with you. So, while chapters 2 and 3 end with an evaluation of the seven churches, it ends with one final appeal recalling the words of Christ also, which is seen in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, verse 29 and also uh, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verse 36. And though directed specifically to this church in Laodicea, in verse 20, this verse is applicable to all of us. And they are beautiful words because God says to us, Behold, listen, he says, listen, listen. I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to you and I will eat with you and you with me. So these are the beautiful words that God is saying to us. So remember, constantly to all the seven churches, first God will always say, I know you. I know you intimately. I am the one who created you. I know you better than you know yourself. 
Therefore, listen, give a year to me. And if you keep my word, says God, I will make you a promise, seven promises, one more beautiful than the other. The final promise to all the churches is, I am standing at your door. Can you just go right now to your door and see if Jesus is out? He says, I am standing, not that door, the door of your heart. I am standing at your door and I am knocking. Who needs to open the door? I need to open. I am knocking. If you hear my voice, he says, if you hear, because some of us have closed our ears to the voice of God, we can hear everybody else's voice. Everybody else's voice. But we do not hear the voice of God. If you hear my voice, and open the door. You know, quite recently, I was joking with, not joking, being a little sarcastic, with, uh, we had um, a cricket tournament in our parish, uh, box cricket. And I said to somebody, of course, I saw some guys who were playing cricket I've never seen in church before. I'm glad that at least for this reason they came to church, and I hope they come into the church now. But I said something, and I want you to think about it. I said, the same people who don't come to church are willing to stand in the hot sun and play cricket for more than six hours that day. And in the hot sun, mind you. And the same people will make excuses. So, hey, there are promises of God and God also said, that he said very clearly to the church in Sardis, be careful, your time is running out because I will come like a thief in the night. So I um, want to thank you for joining uh, me in the study of Revelations. I know it's a bit long. Each of these teachings will be a bit long, but I'm doing this so that you do not um, begin to, you know, have recourse to some uh, Protestant or Pentecostal teachers who put the fear of God and doomsday into you and understand this text for what it is. Uh, so I'm going to see you again, everybody. Um, God bless you. Keep well. Don't forget to like this video, share it with your friends and um, also subscribe to this channel. I'm going to leave you with a blessing. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all.